All right, so we have some interesting things to talk about this week, guys, and one of those things is how you can actually use the Bible in your witchcraft. By the way, if you want to see these videos two weeks earlier, consider subscribing to my Patreon, where you not only get all these videos, but also recipe cards, uh, specific deity profiles, and lots of other interesting things to look at. Video tiers start at $10 a month, so definitely consider checking it out. So before we even get started, let's talk about why you would want to use the Bible in ritual at all, right? Well, as it turns out, a lot of the really old, like, folk Catholicism and a lot of the old traditional, um, you know, like, Devon folk magic and other such from all around Europe, they would incorporate the Bible into their magic because it was a really great way to kind of hide in plain sight, right? By using the Bible, you can still get a lot of magical kick, but also you can kind of make sure that when people look at you, they just see you with a Bible. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? And of course, we can't forget that a lot of these folk practitioners did actually, you know, believe in God and Jesus, right? They weren't only doing, like, all of this as a smoke and mirrors cover. They did actually go to church and they believed in God. And so, of course, they would want to incorporate God into the magic that they were doing. The Bible is a great way to do that because the Bible has so many interesting little tidbits and things to look for that really make some powerful magic. I actually wrote a uh, blog on this a little bit ago in which we go over a couple ways in which you can use it, but here we're going to talk about those plus a few more. So the very first thing I did mention um, in that blog is bibliomancy. And now bibliomancy literally just means divination with a book. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Bible. It can be any single book that you find laying around. It could even be a magazine if you wanted. But using it with the Bible is the most common way to do it. And so what you do, which is very simple, right, is you just basically you ask a question um, and you kind of just let your intuition guide you, right? You you let God tell you where he wants to go, where he wants to stop, and what part of the verse that you're going to land your finger on. It takes some practice, right? Because again, it's your intuition and it's God trying to get through to you through that intuition. But when you ask God a question, this is the easiest way to divin, especially if you are someone who cannot, for whatever reason, use other tools like tarot, um, or runes or anything like that. If you can't be out about your practice or if you just aren't comfortable with those tools, that's fine. The Bible itself is a divinatory tool. So once you've flipped through a little bit and you've, you know, moved your finger around and you've found whatever passage it is that God wants to show to you, sometimes it's not going to be the most clear-cut answer, right? Sometimes you're going to be looking at it and saying, what does that mean? So what I recommend is you look at the rest of that chapter, of that passage, of the rest of the, you know, two pages that it's on, to try and get some context for what it means. If you even wanted to read, like, the essays around the side or the footnotes to further help you explain what's going on there, do that. Because chances are there's something in, like, the theme of that passage, or something in the overarching story, or some kind of moral in it. That's what you're really trying to grab at. Other times, though, it can be that you are only supposed to focus on one single word, and that word represents something. So if I'm here in Philippians 3, um, you know, we can say, like, loss, righteousness. Sometimes those single words can also be a tip, right? It doesn't have to be the entire passage or the entire line at all sometimes. Like all divination, it is a skill, and it requires practice, and it requires nuance. Even with tarot cards, you can't just kind of look at it and take the meaning face value and then just not get it, right? Like, you have to actually weave these definitions into the other cards in your spread. You have to, you know, understand that there is a more abstract value to what they're saying. Like, the suit of coins is not just about money, right? It could be about wealth of friendship or wealth of, you know, peace or something like that. It's more abstract than that. Apply those same tools and concepts to bibliomancy. Not all the time. Is something literal is something uh, plainly stated sometimes you have to get some nuance to it and you have to ask for clarification and kind of weave all these different threads together but as a divinatory tool 10 out of 10 you can absolutely incorporate the Bible into your witchcraft very very useful very very good and then no one can stamp their feet at you either because you're not using tarot cards and you're not using all these other things that they think are so spooky and occult 
You're using the Bible. A lot of Christians do this all the time and don't realize that it counts as divination. Second thing I talk about in my blog is using the Bible for quick cantrips. Now, what is a cantrip? If anyone's ever played D&D, a cantrip is kind of like a very quick uh, spoken spell, right? It's not necessarily uh, the big wizard spells or anything, but they are cheap to cast, they are quick, they are easy, they are, you know, memorable. They're things that you can just kind of pull out at a moment's notice. And that is absolutely a use of the Bible. Namely, in Proverbs and Psalms are you going to find plenty of phrases, um, ideas, themes that can easily be used in the context of a cantrip, right? Where you just need to quickly say a spell and be on your way. This thing full of cantrips. But of course, one thing you are going to notice about some of these is that some of them, while they're short, others can run pretty long, right? They can run pretty long. So you don't have to use the entire proverb, like the entire Proverbs 22, to have a cantrip. In fact, it'd be better for a quick cantrip if you isolated maybe one or two verses that really hit the theme you're going for. And a lot of them can be used for blessings or for baneful things, right? Like for instance, Proverbs 19, the first verse, right? Better a poor man who lives blamelessly than one who speaks perversely and is a dullard. So if someone's saying a bunch of mean stuff against you, you can use that not so much as a baneful thing, but more as a protection for yourself, right? Where it's kind of that reminder, and it's also something that casts humility on the other person. Another good one is the very beginning of Proverbs 15, right? A gentle response allays wrath, a harsh word provokes anger. The tongue of the wise produces much knowledge, but the mouth of dullards pours out folly. That's another quick cantrip that can remind you to, you know, bite your tongue and keep on moving, right? So in those moments where you might be inclined to act out, Proverbs 15, first couple verses, acts as a cantrip, not only for yourself, but for other people too, right? I mean, will you look like some of the people who just randomly start quoting Bible verses? Yes, but the difference is you're not just going Proverbs 15, 1, like that means something. Say the words. The words are what's important. The actual word in a cantrip or a spell, that's what matters. You can say the first Maccabees look up and down all around all day long, but that helps nobody and does nothing. Honestly. Now you're just making everybody pull out Google and no one knows what the hell you're talking about, and you didn't actually activate the cantrip by speaking it. That's one of the key components of a cantrip. Now, Proverbs are definitely a lot better for the short, quick cantrips, but a lot of the Psalms are basically like almost pre-written ritual formula, right? And I think the biggest example is Psalm 109. Psalm 109, that is spiritual napalm. That is like something you only pull out when God gives you the go-ahead because it's intense. It's a lot, and it's really heavy stuff, right? It's, it's, it's a lot. But what's interesting to me is that even in the footnotes here, um, this really interesting thing says, The unique invocation, O God of my praise, here functions as a motivation, alluding to the psalm's conclusion. God must save the supplicant, so he will continue to be praised. Do not keep aloof, as in do not be silent, fitting the psalm's context of evil words. The complaint focuses on the evil words rather than the accusations of the enemies. For this reason, many scholars posit that here and elsewhere, the enemies are magicians. Although other psalms have short and powerful curses, like 139.9, this is by far the longest curse in the Psalter. Some scholars understand this to be the curse of the enemy and understand 20 as a declarative statement rather than a wish. This is the action of my accusers. The curses themselves are rather typical of the Bible in the ancient Near East. And it notices that, you know, 6 through 9, verses 6 through 9, is a long and vituperative curse. In essence, Psalm 109 is a counter curse. So when people say that God is all love and light and rainbows and kisses, no, he was known as a war god for a long time for a reason. But so again, things like Psalms and Proverbs as quick cantrips, things that if you memorize them, you can just kind of snap them out all the time, perfect. And again, as I said, cantrips, you gotta speak the words, not just name the verses, speak the words. And when you say them as if they are a spell, that's when magic happens. I was actually talking to my good friend uh, who is an Episcopalian priest and he mentioned how his wife one day um, 
when, you know, church was getting a little rough, she said one of the, I believe one of the proverbs as if it were a spell. And it, it did its job. It did its job. When you say it with the intention of activating it, when you channel God down here, right, using your own magic to connect to God like a spark, and then speak his word, it's intense. It's heavy stuff. And now the last main thing I talked about um, in that blog is actually using certain sections of the very story of the Bible, such as like the Gospels or any of the other stories in it, to pull on a certain theme. And I think one of my favorite ones to do that with is actually um, Matthew 6, 25, all the way to the end of chapter 6. That's where Jesus is saying, why are you worrying, right? So as an example of some of the things in there, like, look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Right? So that's that whole section where Jesus starts really talking about, like, why are you worrying about clothes and food and this and that? you will be taken care of. That right there is an insanely powerful thing to focus your magic with, right? You can center a ritual for anti-anxiety around that. And in fact, I've done that before and it's worked. And it's really, it's nice. It's almost like, it's almost like that's what liturgy and sermons should be, but never are. Who would have thought? But when you find parts of the stories that have a really important theme, Things that talk about, you know, um, loving people or loving each other or not worrying or overcoming evil or any of these other things, they make a wonderful anchoring point and centerpiece to a longer ritual. And the last thing uh, really in that blog that was more of an afterthought but I really want to dig more into here is that there are lots of parts in the Bible that you can actually use to draw on inspiration to get not only the tools but also the form of your spells. For instance, right, we know that in Revelation it mentions that New Jerusalem was made out of a bunch of different stones, one of them being amethyst. Okay, so we know that amethysts are at least of the twelve are a pretty important one, and that those can be used effectively in spells that, you know, have to do with God. We can also, you know, through things like Matthew 23, 23, or through certain verses in Exodus and Leviticus, find out that God likes frankincense, God likes mint and anise and cumin, God likes bread, right? But not to eat, just to have there. So they give us a clue into the offerings we can put down during a ritual. And they can also give us a hint into other types of ritual format. For instance, in Leviticus 14, when they are casting this kind of illness off of this person, they use two birds. One of which gets sacrificed, the other of which gets, you know, sets a free and flies away. There's a reason for that, and when you learn the reasons for these things, you can understand their function and bring them into your own magic. The first bird is sacrificed as that kind of tribute, right? The, that destruction kind of goes into that spell, and that blood is sprinkled on the afflicted purse seven times. From this we learn the number seven is pretty important magically, and it shows up a whole lot, honestly, um, in the Bible. And also that one thing being sacrificed is important. The next bird is flown off because the thought was that it was carrying the curse away. So combining some modern witchcraft ideas with that, say you have two identical pods of spell items and such things, one of them can be burned and the other, combining modern witchcraft ideas, can maybe have a little bit of your hair or a fingernail or something. And then once you've burned all of this to ash, kind of rubbing the other thing into that ash and casting it out of your house encourages whatever nastiness is following you to follow that thing instead and to get it away from you and have it attack a basically a decoy that it can't do anything against. And you also find the secret to Christian magic in the Gospels, as well as an axe. But Jesus says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can do pretty much whatever. You can do incredible stuff. And later, as we see in Acts, when Simon the Magus is coming around, and he's, for all intents and purposes, doing some pretty good magic, the fact is that the Apostles have stronger magic, and they have that stronger magic because they have the Holy Spirit, because they have that faith. Simon literally tries to buy the secret to their magic and pisses Peter off pretty royally for it, because it's not something that can be bought. It's something that you just have to lean into, right? It's something that you have to really believe in. And so this is where actually this was confirmed to me when I spoke to St. Paul the Apostle in one of my interviews with the saints. And he said, yep, 
right here is that little spark, that little bit of magic God gave us, and that's the purpose of it is to connect to him. And that's where the magic comes from. The faith and the connection, right, with that Holy Spirit, that's what gives us the magic that we have as Christian witches. So those secrets are in the Bible, but here's the thing about the Bible. You have to read between the lines. You can't just open the book and expect it to say, here's how to do witchcraft. It will never say that for a lot of reasons. One being that Jesus was already being accused of being a demonolator and being possessed and being a fraud and just a, a hack magician, so on and so forth by everyone around him. They wanted to distance the idea of magic from Jesus so that his critics would stop having more ammunition to throw at him, right? But that means that all those secrets are still there. Notice how the Gospel of Mark actually describes some of Jesus's procedures for doing magic, like how he spits into mud and rubs it on a man's eyes, how he mutters into the sky and sighs and stuff. These are techniques of the Greek magical papyri and of other rabbis at the time. These are techniques that are actually recorded in Greek magical papyri. Pagan spellbooks. A lot of magic was traded at the time, and a lot of uh, techniques were too. So it's very easy to see how, you know, Mark was likely writing to a Gentile audience and included those motifs in there so people would understand what Jesus was doing. They would understand that what he was doing was not just, you know, random power, but was also a skill. And it's a skill that we can access as well, and you can find out how to do that by actually reading the Gospels, reading Acts, and how the Apostles went on their day, and by spending time with God. And lastly, you can use the Bible as a meditation tool. What is ritual, if not meditation, with a certain intent and goal at the end, right? However, you don't have to have a whole ritual set up. You can just meditate on certain ideas and certain passages here, too. And by reading these over and over again and focusing on those themes, you can, you know, get into that kind of zone and you can connect to God through that. Again, not for any, you know, witchy purpose, no tools necessary, but just to further strengthen your own connection to God and your own sense of your own magic, as well as also better understanding the character of God himself. Now, if you're going to get any kind of Bible, I honestly think that the Jewish Study Bible and Jewish Annotated New Testament are some of my favorites because, let's be real with ourselves here, Christianity came out of Judaism. Jesus was a Jewish man. In order to understand anything that Jesus was talking about, you have to know something about Judaism and something about the laws and the context and the culture in which they sprung forth from. In fact, the Jewish Annotated New Testament's entire goal is to not only help Jewish people understand what Christians believe, but to help Christians understand the actual very Jewish elements that made up the things Jesus was saying. There's been a lot of harm done trying to separate Jesus from his Jewishness. A lot of harm, okay? A lot. And so by remembering this culture, this context, by respecting it enough to try and learn about it and be an ally to this community, you will have a better understanding of God. Because remember, before Jesus was here, God was the God of Israel, pretty much exclusively, right? You have to consider that when you are running around spending time with this God. If you don't understand him in the proper cultural context, historical context, political context, you're not going to be able to effectively read between the lines, understand what's going on here, and make use of his word in a very spiritual and... I guess you could say miraculous context. Because as we know, magic and miracle were very much synonymous in antiquity, right? So next time you're planning out a really big like meditation or maybe a moon ritual or something and you have a certain intent you'd like to focus on, grab your Bibles because these are treasure troves of ideas in structure, in theme, in, you know, actual the word itself. These are incredible, incredible tools for structuring your space and structuring your magical and spiritual practice and how you engage with God. Never leave his word out of it. We can say a lot of things about, you know, mistranslations and all the other stuff, but the fact of the matter is, this still has a lot of power from thousands and thousands and thousands of years of people honoring it as such and for God putting it here in the first place, right? They're powerful texts. They shouldn't be discarded just because uh, people have edited them for certain agendas. 
when you know how to read between the lines and you have the scholarship to kind of sift through things that sound like they were changed and don't sound right, you can both have that better understanding of them and still have them to understand God's character and to better engage with him through the magic he gave you. So with all that said, I hope that is a helpful overview of how you might use these very large texts to help you in your magical practice, and I will see you guys next week to talk about the Book of Enoch. See ya!